verse 5. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose its seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, or living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood, stood, he's been sitting, according to the Bible, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book, or scroll, out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden, actually bowls, full of incense, which are the prayers of saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book or the scroll, and to open its seals, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God. Some of you have texts that say redeemed men. Redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us. Some of you have versions that read them. Has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we, and some of you have versions that say they. They. We shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures or beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature that is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four living creatures, or beasts, said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down, and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. I play the Messiah when I study the book of Revelation. And uh, it's just thrilling. Well, the scroll with seven seals, we looked at the place of the scroll being in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. We looked at the problem, who is worthy to open the scroll, talked a little bit about a will, a testament. We looked at the person who can open the scroll. We mentioned he's the Lion of Judah, and he's in the line of David, the root of David. Very interesting, they say root because the Bible often calls him the branch of David. So he's the root that causes the whole thing as well as the product of that messianic line, a phenomenal statement. And third, he is the Lamb of God, and that's where we ended last time. The word lamb used 186 times in the Bible, 29 times, believe it or not, in the book of Revelation. And it's a Greek word for a little lamb, just a little helpless lamb. And uh, it's marvelous what is said here. Let's just note a number of things. One, the centrality of that lamb. It says, in the midst, verse 6. In the midst. Jesus is right in the middle. Turn back to chapter 1, verse 13. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands or candlesticks. He's in the middle. Matthew 18, 20 says, Where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst, in the middle. That, by the way, is referring not to a church gathering or a home Bible study group or even a prayer group. That is referring to two or three witnesses that give testimony to somebody's statement about what they have done. And the authority of our Lord is behind the two or three brothers who are witnesses. So where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. Very interesting statement. He's in the middle of everything. Second thing is his condition. The interesting thing is, one, he's standing, and two, he's slain. Stood a lamb, says Revelation 5, verse 6. But according to the Bible, when Jesus ascended, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, thus indicating that his atonement was done and finished. No priest ever sat down in the temple or the tabernacle, but he who reigns above, he who sits at the right hand of the majesty on high, he sat down. But now he stands up, 
and in a dramatic fashion, it's an indication that he's taken over. This is the day of the Lord, a day of judgment in which God will unleash his vengeance, and he's going to do it through the Lamb of God. Can you believe it? A lamb and a lion. They almost seem like they don't go together. And uh, there's a point here, because he who is the Redeemer is also the Revenger. And he's going to bring his vengeance on the world, and that's what the whole tribulation period is all about. It's a phenomenal statement. He's standing, a reminder that his work of intercession is no longer needed. Now begins his work of intervention, as the kingdoms of this world now become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Not only his centrality and his condition are interesting to us in terms of his standing, but also that he was slain, a lamb as though it had been slain. Verse 12, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Interesting. God pictures the Lord Jesus as our crucified Savior. All through eternity, we will never escape the one fact that he died for us. I don't know how central the cross is in your mind and theology, but I just made a quick review for myself of the centrality of the cross. It's almost as though the Christian community has a fundamental error in it when we decide that there's something we can do either to save ourselves or to grow in Christ and we leave out the cross. It is by the cross alone that sin has been cared for. There has been no other method. The only thing that washes our sins is the blood of the lamb that was slain. No wonder we're going to shout, worthy is the lamb forever and ever. For then we'll know more than what we know now, that it's only through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that our sin is dealt with. You can be cleansed. I don't know who you are or what's going on in your life, but if you're here tonight and there's sin and junk in your life and you know it and you want to get out of it, let me tell you something. You're going to have to go to the cross. There is no other way. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of the Lord Jesus. And it's interesting, the centrality of the cross is also seen in Christian life and growth. For the Bible tells us that our old nature, our old man, has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be rendered inoperative, that henceforth we should not be slaves to sin. The Bible tells us to count ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, because we were crucified with Christ. Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me, point of time, and gave himself for me, again the cross. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, walk in love, how? As Christ loved us and gave himself an offering for us. Over and over again, all uh, Christian life and principles of living for the Lord now are rooted back into the cross. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and what? Gave himself for her that he might wash and cleanse and sanctify it. When I discover that God wants me to be holy, I find in the Christian world there are disciplines that are suggested. And while they all might be helpful to our understanding, it's interesting that according to the Bible, holiness is rooted in the cross. The Bible tells us that we are sanctified by the one offering of the body of the Lord Jesus once for all. Aren't you glad of that? After listing, listing a bunch of gross sins that were among the people of Corinth, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians six eleven, such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, made holy, you are justified, declared righteous in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the cross that has achieved it all. And in heaven, we will remember that in a way that perhaps we have not done as we should down here. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. 
1 Peter 1, verse 18 says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. You can't buy this or earn your way into God's favor. You're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming in John 1, 29, he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. What good news that was to Jewish uh, listeners as they remembered well the lamb was a covering. But John said, no, not cover, takes away. For the lamb of God is totally different from all those sacrificial animals. The blood of bulls and goats, wrote Paul in Hebrews 10.4, can never take away sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can redeem us and set us free from sin, death, and hell. And I remind you, it happened 1,900 years ago. And whether you believe it or not will determine whether or not, one, you will be in heaven, and two, you will learn to grow in Christ and learn to find peace, freedom, release, restoration, healing, forgiveness, deliverance. For it all comes again through Christ and his shed blood. The Bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1, 7 we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And I think it's worth at least a praise hallelujah of some sort on your part. Amen? Amen? What a wonderful, wonderful joy floods our heart when we realize it is the Lamb of God alone who can set us free. Not only his centrality and condition, but his control. It says in verse 6, he has seven horns. And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Now the last one we've already studied. The seven spirits of the seven angels who are prominent throughout the book. Who do the master's bidding. And here it's connected with the son of God, the lamb. And his work uh, throughout the tribulation as the son of God will now, as a lion, begin to devour. And to bring the vengeance of God on those who have turned their backs on him. Uh, but he has... Uh, angels who are announcing his message, angels who are mediating out his judgments on the earth, the seven spirits of God. They're like the seven eyes of the Lord. They see throughout all the earth, and they are going to render uh, his judgments upon the earth. But what about the seven horns? Horns always a symbol of authority and power. But turn back to Joshua chapter 6. Uh, it's interesting to me, when you compare Scripture with Scripture, what you find. And this is one that is a little hard to uh, connect. But in, in Joshua 6, we have a reference to seven horns. In verse 2, uh, dealing with the conquest of Jericho, the Lord said unto Joshua, Joshua 6, verse 2, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and its king and the mighty men of valor, and ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days." And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So before the ark are the seven priests blowing the seven horns. So when it says of the Lamb of God, he has seven horns. It represented the completeness of God's uh, plan of victory over Jericho. Seven horns blowing by seven priests before the ark of the God, uh, ark of God, announcing that God is going to give us a victory at Jericho. And here we have a picture in heaven. And connecting the two, we have the Lamb of God who died for our sins with seven horns announcing his great victory, not just over Jericho, but over the entire earth. And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits or seven angels, will be sent out with those judgments. And uh, it's really a spectacular scene to say the least. Now, let's begin at verse 8 and look at the new song of the redeemed. Back at Revelation chapter 5. In verse 8 it says, And when he had taken the scroll, 
the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. I want you to notice four things in this uh, section, verses 8 to 14. Four things. One, the immediate reaction of the four and twenty elders. It says they fell down before the Lamb. In that it might have been cumbersome and inappropriate and difficult for us to do that as an audience in the pews and seats that we have here, I did think about it. I wonder what would be the effect upon us all if upon hearing the praises of worthy is the lamb that was slain, if we all just fell down on our face before the lamb. Interesting, isn't it? Go back to chapter 4, verse 10, and let's notice that this is the reaction always of the four and twenty elders, whom we've already established is the completed church of Jesus Christ in heaven during the tribulation. And this seems to be what they're always doing. Chapter 4, verse 10. The four and twenty elders fell down before him that sits on the throne. Chapter 5, verse 14 as well, says the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him. In chapter 7, verse 11, it says the four living creatures and the elders, they fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Chapter 11, verse 16, the four and twenty elders who sat before God on their thrones fell upon their faces and worshipped God. And in chapter 19, verse 4, the four and twenty elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah, or praise the Lord. Now if that represents the completed church in heaven, then that's referring to me and what I'm going to do in heaven. What you're going to do, those of you who have come to know the Lord, the one thing we do is not just sit so and sour on our thrones. We instead fall off of our thrones frequently on our faces and worship Him who lives forever and ever. Whenever the praise goes forth, and apparently it goes on all the time, we just keep falling down before the, before the Lord. You see, worship will then become an ever-present reality in us, whereas now somebody has to preach on it or get a music group up or talk to us a little bit about it or get us stimulated somehow to do it. But worship will then be our number one priority. It'll be just like second nature. Oh, there's a song again. Bang! <laughs> Hit the floor. Fall down and worship him. You see, the word worship does mean to bow down. That's what it means. How important it is that when we sing and praise him, whether we lift our hands to praise him or our voices or whatever, that in our hearts we are literally bowing down before him. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Their immediate reaction involves two things, praise and secondly, prayer. Now in praise, in Revelation 5, it's interesting, it says, verse 8, the uh, four living creatures and four and twenty elders fell down, having every one of them harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of saints. Now what I'm going to tell you now is a part of the argument that I'm going to present to you tonight to prove that we are going to be in heaven during the tribulation and are not going to go through the tribulation. So you must listen carefully. It's very important. It says, having every one of them harps, does the every one refer to the four living creatures and four and twenty elders? Uh, do, the, do the angels, cherubim, uh, have harps? And do they have golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints? And do they sing a new song, saying, Thou art worthy who has redeemed us? There are many, many post-tribulationalists who argue that the text demands that they also are doing the singing. And they can prove, therefore, that angels in some sense can sing the song 
And therefore, since they are not redeemed angels, that they must be singing the song about somebody other than themselves. Are you following that? If the four living creatures have the harps and have the bowls of prayers of the saints, because it calls them saints, then these could be angels, the 24 elders, and they're singing a song about someone other than themselves. They're not singing, you've redeemed us. That's why many translations have the word them or they. Well, I have a problem with that. First of all, in verse 8, the word everyone is a masculine pronoun. Now, in Greek as well as in English, but more powerfully in Greek, uh, a pronoun must agree in gender and number with the noun that it modifies. It can only refer to the elders because it's a masculine noun. It cannot refer to the beasts or the living creatures because that happens to be neuter, not masculine. So the text is saying it's only the four and twenty elders who have every one of them harps and golden bowls full of incense, and only they are singing the new song. Oh yes, I have no problem with the angels saying it, for they are picked up in verse 11. But we do have a problem in verse 9, dealing with the fact that they say he's redeemed us. And since angels do not participate in our salvation, according to Peter's book, we have a little problem here. But the problem is answered by noticing the Greek text. Everyone is masculine, must refer only to elders, and cannot refer to the word beasts or living creatures, which refers to cherubim angels, according to the book of Ezekiel. Now it says they have harps. Haven't you always wondered whether you're going to play a harp or not? People sometimes see Christians as sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Um, well, I don't know about the cloud, but we are definitely going to play harps. And uh, the word harps is used 20 times in the Bible, three of them in Revelation. Uh, additional statements are in chapter 14, verse 2, about the 144,000. Chapter 15, verse 2, about all those who are martyrs during the tribulation. Uh, the Old Testament word for harp is used 42 times, and there's a lot of interesting statements all the way through the Psalms, and it reminds us that harps are the number one instrument used to praise the Lord. It's a stringed instrument, so all of you guitar players can, you know, kind of say, you yeah, know, I'm there. I'm already ready for the glory time, and I, I know how to strum it. For all of those who are not musical and cannot play, I want you to know that God is going to change that. <laughs> Isn't it great? Some people say, well, I'm not musical. I can tell the whole audience of believers, you are going to be musical. <laughs> God's going to see to it that we're all musical in heaven in a way that we've never known here. But harps are mentioned throughout the book of Psalms, and it's a good uh, word study if you'd like to do that. Just take the word harp and trace it all the way through Psalms, and it will be a blessing to you of how to praise the Lord. But it didn't just involve praise, it involved prayer. It says at the end of verse 8, they had golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of saints. Interesting, that's something that the priests would do on the altar of incense as they would uh, pour out the incense fragrance and the fire of the altar of incense that was right in front of the second veil that behind which was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, and the high priest could only go in there once a year. So the furthest point that a priest ever got in the daily worship was ending it up at the altar of incense where the smoke would fill the whole inside of the place, a beautiful fragrance, a special oil that could only be put together and used for worship. How interesting. And that incense represented as the smoke, the aroma, filled the tabernacle and as it were was rising uh, to the roof, it pictured prayer. For the priest would stand there and they took turns. They had courses or divisions, assignments, but they would pray uh, on behalf of all the people of Israel. Now, here the 24 elders are pictured doing that. Because you see, God has made us who are believers both kings, for we will rule and reign with Christ, and priests, for we can come directly into the presence of God because the Lamb was the veil. The veil represented his flesh. When, it, when Jesus died, it was torn. And we have a new and living way which he consecrated for us into the very presence and holy of holies of God. We can go directly into the throne room of God, come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Aren't you glad you're a believer? 
Man, God has really done some wonderful things for us a lot of us ignore. Prayer. Turn over chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. What is all this uh, prayer, this incense going up to God? Well, as we get ready for the seven trumpet judgments, which come out of the seventh seal, it says in verse 2, I saw the seven angels who stood before God. To them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given to him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, cast it upon the earth, and there were voices and thunderclaps claps and lightnings and an earthquake. The point of this is, what is the prayer that is going up? And the prayer will be recorded in chapter 6, which we'll get to shortly, as the souls under the altar say, How long, O Lord, holy and true, before you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And in symbolic fashion, the angel takes the incense and takes it off of the altar and throws it on the earth. The point is the prayer is being answered as God pours out his judgments on the earth. When they say how long, the answer is now. Tribulation period, God's wrath poured out on the earth. Very interesting. Back to chapter 5. There are four things we want you to see about the new song of the redeemed in heaven. Uh, their immediate reaction, we've noticed, involves praise and prayer. But their continual response, uh, verse 9 and 10, records this. It says they sung or sang a new song. Interesting that in the Greek, that's a present active indicative verb. It literally means they are continuing to sing. So heaven is filled with music. They are constantly singing, worthy is the Lamb. Do you know that when you're filled with the Spirit, you have a song in your heart? The Bible says that one of the characteristics of people who are filled with the Spirit is they sing and make melody in their hearts to the Lord. You say, well, man, if you heard me sing, you'd want to <laughs> shut it down. <laughs> uh, make a joyful noise on the Lord. But you can have a song in your heart. It didn't say out loud, so you can have it in your heart. And those who are filled with God's Spirit, there's an inward joyfulness toward the Lord. Very interesting. Now, around you, it may be very serious. A lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of struggle. But when you're filled with the Spirit inside of you, there is a joyful response to God. There's a singing in your heart to the Lord. And one day when we get to heaven, there's just going to be constant singing. Imagine singing and not losing your voice. Or singing not getting tired. Just keep music going all the time. Now, several things I want you to notice here. First of all, there are prophecies in the Bible of this new song. Turn back to Psalm chapter 33. Psalm chapter 33. The first thing I want you to notice about their continual response, which is continuing to sing, is that there are prophecies of the new song in the Bible. And I just want you to keep your Bible handy right now. We're just going to flip through a number of references, all, uh, most of them in the Psalms. It says, Psalm 33, 3, sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. Uh, turn to chapter 40, verse 3. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. When you become a believer, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says you're a new creation in Christ. And out of that new creation comes a new song. Uh, the focus isn't uh, the Rolling Stones or Grateful Dead. Uh, the focus isn't there anymore. The focus is on the lamb that was slain. There's a new song, a new focus in your heart because you're a new creature in Christ. And it's on the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in chapter 96, verse 1. Don't write me any letters about those two groups I mentioned, please. <laughs> chapter 96, verse 1. I think it's important to say here that a lot of us need to be careful about the music we listen to. 
It is characteristic of those that are filled with the Spirit to want to focus on the Lord Jesus. I really don't want to argue about the style. Uh, it doesn't make any difference to me about the style. Uh, I happen to like classical music. One guy came by my office the other day, is listening to it, and he says, Man, that's old. <laughs> yeah, you're right, it's old, but I like it. But I like all kinds of music, and uh, I know you do too. And those who love the Lord are just thrilled when they go to other cultures, especially in missions, and they hear music that they've never sung, but they hear these dear people praising the Lord in the sounds of their culture and focusing on the Lord Jesus. The new song is not a style of music. The new song is directed towards the Lord from a redeemed heart, praising the Lord. In Psalm 96, 1, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Chapter 98, verse 1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. And it goes on to discuss that. Chapter 144 of Psalms. I'll just skip over some. Chapter 144, verse 9. I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. The new song is a heart that just constantly praises the Lord. From the rising of the sun till it's going down, let the name of the Lord be praised. Psalm 149, 1. Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of saints. The new song is a song of the redeemed. Go back to Revelation chapter 5. I think one thing we need to understand in looking at their continual response of singing unto the Lord is the preeminence of the Lamb. The preeminence of the Lamb. Thou art worthy. That describes in very simple language the whole issue of praise. Thou art worthy. Psalm 115 one says, Not unto us give glory, but unto thy name alone, O Lord. Thou art worthy. The essence of the whole song, this new song in the heart of the redeemed, is the preeminence of the Lamb. The Bible says it pleased the Father that in Him, Jesus, Colossians 1.19, all the fullness should dwell. Or literally all the fullness was pleased to dwell in Him. Jesus is to be number one. Jesus was placed as head of the church the firstborn out of the dead. Uh, Jesus was given a name, according to Ephesians 1, that is above every name, above every principality and power, thrones, dominions, whatever they are. Jesus is preeminent. Thou art worthy. Notice the place of the cross, because it says in verse 9, Thou art worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. Why? For, or it's the Greek uh, preposition because of what's the cause as to why he is worthy boy you could say a lot of things he is certainly worthy because he's a creator all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made john 1 3 he is certainly worthy because all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge dwell in him colossians 2 3 he is certainly worthy because he sustains us and by his grace we are able to manage through life in ways that we cannot without him. He is the shepherd and I shall not want. There are many reasons to say he's worthy, but the place of the cross again. Why do we sing this song forever? Thou art worthy because thou wast slain. It's very clear. Look at the purchase of the redeemed. It says, you have redeemed us to God by thy blood. I'll comment on the us-them problem in just a moment, just to say this, that when the redeemed are purchased, it's only by the blood. That's the only payment. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what, do, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God? You are not your own. Verse 20 says, you are bought with a price. The price was the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He bought you. He owns you. You are a slave of Christ to do his bidding. The purchase of the redeemed. Go back to chapter 1 of Revelation. Remember from verse 5 that when John gave greetings from Jesus Christ, 
He said, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The purchase of the redeemed. Notice the people who are redeemed. Chapter 5, again, verse 9. Who are the people who are redeemed in glory? It says, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Obviously, by the word people, we know these are human beings. Those are who are redeemed. Only human beings are redeemed, according to the Bible. And notice, please, in chapter 7, verse 9, you see a similar statement said of the great multitude that comes out of the tribulation who are saved. It says, no man can number this multitude, chapter 7, verse 9, of all nations, kindreds, peoples, tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. They come from every tribe, every people. By the way, the church of Jesus Christ should truly reflect God's mission. It is God's desire to take out of every tribe, nation, tongue, every ethnic group, is in the Greek text, out of every people, every language, a people for himself. It is pitiful, beyond belief, when we somehow decide that there is a certain group that doesn't belong with, quote, us. Friends, they come out of every tribe, people, tongue, and nation. And we ought to recognize that always and stand for it wherever. In chapter 14, verse 6, in discussing the work of the 144,000, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, chapter 14, verse 6, having the everlasting gospel to preach only to white Anglo-Saxons Americans. No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> Have the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. By the way, I hope you're a world Christian. I love America. I thank God for the freedoms we have. I'm sorry we're so far away from our original founders' intentions. I love America, but I am not patriotic to the point of ignoring God's plan. God's plan is to re reach every nation, tribe, people, tongue from all over the world. And we need to be world Christians. The field is the world. And we need to have a heart concern for it. Uh, when the Persian Gulf happened, Persian Gulf War, um, I felt constrained, and I'm sorry to say I haven't kept it up like I should, but I felt constrained to pray, pray for the salvation of Saddam Hussein. And I thought a lot about the war over there in Bosnia, and I thought about the Serbs. You notice how our media is preparing us to hate those people. I want to tell you, they've done some torturous, barbaric things what I've seen alone, just in the various news reports, is enough to make you sick and throw up. I don't know if you've seen some of that. It's horrifying. You say, well, they're doing it to the Muslims, and look what they did to us. And you know, you know how the attitude can happen. You hear it being said and spoken. My dear friends, God loves the Bosnian Muslims, and God loves the Serbs also. We need to be careful. One of my favorite missionary stories is of the Far Eastern Gospel Crusade. For that great mission that focused on the Orient, we need to remind ourselves, was started by American servicemen who fought those people in World War II but could not get out of their hearts a burden to reach those very same people with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it was the military servicemen that went back into those countries that we fought in the Second World War and brought them the wonderful good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we never lose what God has indicated so often in his word that he's bringing out of every nation, every tongue, every people, a people for himself to praise his wonderful name. Look at the position of the redeemed back in Revelation chapter 5. The position of the redeemed. It says in verse 10, you have made us unto God kings and priests. Now some translations read a kingdom of priests. But the best texts that follow the King James tradition in this case, have kings and priests. We are not just a kingdom of priests. We are going to rule and reign with Christ as kings. Uh, look back at chapter 1, please. In chapter 1, verse 6, it says, He has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. That theme is repeated again here in chapter 5. The promise to the redeemed is stated here at the end of verse 10. And we shall reign 
on the earth. Turn to Revelation chapter 20 and look at verse 6. Revelation 20 verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, that's for believers only, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Look at chapter 22 verse 5. In the future, in the eternal state, in the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. It says, there shall be no night there, and they need no lamp, neither light of the sun, but the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. It won't just be in a thousand year millennial state. We are going to reign forever and ever. I don't know what God has in mind. Maybe we're going to manage various galaxies. I have no idea. But we are going to rule with Christ. We are kings and priests unto the Lord. Now back to Revelation 5, and let's take a look at the problem of this text. Is it us or them? Now here it is, folks, in a nutshell. Listen carefully. This is going to determine whether you walk out of here believing in the pre-tribulational rapture or whether you believe in the post-tribulational rapture. I'm going to quote one of the greatest scholars on the book of Revelation, who is also a post-tribulationist. He says in his book, George Eldon Ladd, Commentary on Revelation, that if in fact it is us, then that group is speaking about their own redemption and must refer to the church, which immediately makes us all pre-tribulational. Because whatever the 24 elders are, they represent a completed group of people. He happens to believe they are angels. I believe they cannot be angels, and it's stated so back in our message in chapter 4. But this is a little bit stronger than you can believe. I decided before I come, came tonight to go through all of the Bibles I have. Now, I got two shelves of them in all kinds of translations. And I was amazed how often this particular footnote appears. Most ancient authorities agree that the word is them or they. Even in versions that are King James and support the us in the text, there's a little footnote. I have a King James. It has a footnote. Here's what it says. Most early manuscripts omit us in verse 9 and read them and they instead of us and we in verse 10. One of the leading pre-tribulational teachers in America says in his commentary that beyond a doubt all scholars know that the translation is them and they, not us. That we pre-tribulationalists should not use this passage to teach our point since it reveals our lack of scholarship. Oh, hey, there are worse statements than that. In various commentaries. Well, you know... I got kind of, you know, inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> I decided to look into the matter. I have spoken publicly on this matter and have been asked also by some who are Greek manuscript men to keep my mouth shut. I'm not going to. See, the, uh, the insinuation is, listen carefully, the insinuation is that the average layperson cannot really fathom this. I don't believe that at all. I believe the average layperson can fathom it and ought to know about it. First of all, out of all the manuscripts we have, the most important ones are, of course, in the original language, Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, far more important than any other language into which the Greek is translated. Well, how many manuscripts out of some 5,000 on the New Testament do you think have the book of Revelation, any part of it in the manuscript? Only 95. There's only 95 known Greek manuscripts on the book of Revelation in, in existence in the world. Now, some may be under the, uh, you know, the protective covering of some hill that archaeology hasn't uncovered yet, but we have only 95 known manuscripts in Greek on the book of Revelation. Now, I ask myself, since these are all fragments, how many of those have Revelation 5 in the fragment? Very interesting, only 24 out of the 95 have Revelation 5. Now, there's only 24 Greek manuscripts in the world 
that have Revelation 5 in it. I find it extremely interesting that 23 out of the 24 read us. There is, in fact, only one manuscript, Codex Alexandrinus, that says us. Now, you know, I mean, it says them. No. Yes, them. Hey, after that lion thing last week, I need your help, okay? <laughs> Next project. When the Latin Vulgate was translated, 4th century A.D., Jerome, who translated the Latin Vulgate, became the standard Bible of the Catholic Church for a thousand years, at least, and some still use it. The Latin Vulgate of Jerome, had, he had more Greek manuscripts available to him than we even know exist on this book. And I find it extremely interesting that in the Latin Vulgate it reads us in both verses, verse 9 and 10. First person plural. You say, well, that's interesting. But, you know. One guy came to me and he said, well, you know, the King James in 1611 didn't have all the evidence. And it wasn't until 1634 that they finally got all the manuscripts from Europe over to England because King James pushed through to get the 1611 out just in glory to his own name. And uh, really we ought to look at the 1634 edition which had all the manuscripts. So, you know, when people do that, they kind of intimidate you. So I decided to go look up the 1634 edition. Kind of interesting. It reads us too. I looked up the versions. You know, versions mean Greek translated in another language, like Latin and Syriac and Armenian and Coptic and all that stuff. I decided to look up the versions, and I found out they all read us. Well, this is getting more interesting. As a matter of fact, in verse 10, where most of you who have a New American Standard, New International, or footnotes on your King James, it says it should read them, in verse 10, the word them in the third person plural, they shall reign, are all what we call variant readings, even in the manuscript evidence. It means there's a lot of variation as to whether it's them or not. You say, I don't really care about this. Well, you better start caring. By the way, it would be possible to read us in verse 9, since only one manuscript ever changed it. And you could read them in verse 10 as an editorial comment of the redeemed ones in verse 9 and still have the same argument. Did everybody follow that? I didn't think so. <laughs> Here's the point. In verse 9, it's very clear that only one Greek manuscript contains anything but us. Well, let's suppose for a moment, even though there are variant readings that have they and them and they shall reign, let's suppose that that's correct. Then verse 10 is simply an editorial comment on the us of verse 9. The problem here would still exist. If you say in verse 9, thou art worthy because you have redeemed us to God, then the 24 elders are singing a song about themselves that they in fact are redeemed. Angels cannot be redeemed. They are not angels. They have to be people who are redeemed. Is everybody listening? I believe Revelation 1 really settles it. Go back to Revelation 1. Verse 4 says, John to the seven churches. Verse 5, from Jesus Christ, in the middle of the verse, unto him that loved. Well, isn't that interesting? He didn't say unto him that loved them and washed them from their sins in his own blood. He didn't say he made them kings and priests unto God. And this is a direct quotation also in chapter 5, that he's made us kings and priests. No, the us belongs and Revelation 1, 4 to 6 settles it because there's no variation on that text whatsoever. You see, friends, what this means is the 24 elders in heaven, a completed body of people in heaven, are literally redeemed believers. The church of Jesus Christ is in heaven all during the tribulation. It is not on earth. And people say, well, what if you're wrong? And I always say, you know, I can change my view if we get in the tribulation. And we all laugh. But I just want you to know, I do not expect at all being on earth in tribulation. Theologically, personally, emotionally, spiritually, in every way, I believe the evidence is overwhelming. The church will be in heaven while the tribulation goes on on earth. They're singing a song about themselves. You redeemed us. 
with your blood. And I praise the Lord for that. Which brings us to the heavenly refrain. Verse 11, chapter 5. We've got to hurry. Chapter 5, verse 11. I heard the voice of many angels. Talk about a multitude. It says 10,000 times 10,000. Now, people figure that out, you know, and figure they have the number. Well, the Bible adds, and thousands of thousands, in case you were trying to figure it. <laughs> but just to help you a little bit with that, the word 10,000 is not going to help you if you're trying to just multiply 10,000 times 10,000. Because... 10,000 is the highest number in the Greek mathematical system. What it is saying is, however high you could count, there's so many people you can't count them. Uh, chapter 7, verse 9 should have told you when it says, when God even saves people in tribulation, it's a number nobody can count. There's going to be so many people in heaven, it's going to blow us away just seeing the number of them. And some of us are going to be shocked at who's there. <laughs> We're going to look around and say, no, not him. You know, but hopefully you'll be redeemed enough that you won't, you'll be, oh, glad to see you, you know. <laughs> now, the message they proclaim is interesting. Count up the words and how many of them are there in verse 12. Power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing. How many words? Seven. You see the word seven all the way through uh, the book of Revelation. A sevenfold, manifold, complete description of the Lamb's worthiness. Power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing. All of it belongs to Him. And then look at the universal reverence for God the Father and God the Son in verse 13 and 14. The adoration comes from every creature in heaven, on the earth, under the earth. Are those demons? Some people say, I resent you saying the demons can worship the Lord. Listen, God's going to make unbelievers bow the knee and recognize that he's Lord. They don't worship from our, quote, redeemed worshiping hearts, but they will fall down before him and recognize him as Lord. Can God also do that of demons? You bet. The demons fell at Jesus' feet and said, surely you are the Son of God. Demons believe there's one God, says James 2.19, and they tremble. No, it won't be in saving faith, and no, it won't be the expression of worship in the redeemed, but everything will praise the Lord. Everything will acknowledge that he is who he claimed, even in unbelief. Everybody is going to. The acclaim will go to the Father and the Son, the Bible makes it clear. I like the word amen in verse 14. The four living creatures said amen. The Greek text has what we call an imperfect te tense, which means they kept on saying it. And there are folks that don't want us to say amen today. But in heaven, the four living creatures, you talk about an amen corner. <laughs> I was preaching in a church in Cleveland, Ohio, just having a wonderful time, preaching up a storm, and there's a group of men who sit over on the side. They just kept saying amen. Amen! That's right. You know, that's like sick them to the dog. And after the service was over, I asked the pastor, I said, what were those four men over there sitting on that pew? He said, turn to Revelation 5. <laughs> there are four beasts <laughs> who say amen. And literally, that's what he had. He had four men sit on the pew, and they say amen all during the service. <laughs> Keeps the pastor pumped up, I guess. I don't know. But notice the act of worship which characterizes the 24 elders again. We mentioned it earlier. They fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. We recognize that some here may not have a personal relationship with the Lamb of God. And our message is not run around the church 10 times and try to get to heaven or to do these 20 things. Our message is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Following our service, uh, to my left and your right, down this wall, there's a door. You can also get from the outside. We have a very large prayer room area, and our people are there. They'd love to pray with you and talk with you and help you in whatever way you can, we can to introduce you to our lovely Savior. Maybe as a Christian, your heart's been lifted up, and yet the reality is you're going through some hard times. And if we can pray and lift your heart to trust in our living God, we invite you to come by. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the joy 
of Revelation 5 and getting a glimpse of what heaven will be like. And I pray, Lord, that we may leave this place with praise in our hearts, a song in our hearts, the new song of the redeemed who have been set free by the blood of Christ. And may our day tomorrow be different because we begin with praise. And throughout the day we praise. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive all the praise, all the glory, all the blessing. Lord, we once again commit our lives to you in Jesus' name. Amen.